I'm your host, Scott, and today I'm joined by Dr. Bruno Patti, who is the chairman and CEO of InfoWorks. Welcome, Bruno. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me here. All right. So my understanding is that you're a true global citizen. You were born in Washington, D.C., but you lived in the East Coast, and but you also lived in Italy and India. So I'm wondering how that upbringing kind of helped shape your perspectives. Well, I, I think it's... Uh... It's an exposure to other places, other cultures, other systems that inevitably plays a big role in how business works today. Uh, there are clearly cultural differences as you cross borders and cross continents. Uh, growing up in all of those places has clearly helped uh, ease the transition from one business environment to another, uh, as you do uh, need to have. Uh, that ability as uh, you know in, in any global business setting so i have to ask you how many languages do you speak i grew up with five uh, and uh, you know there were two indian languages hindi and Oriya. Uh i went to school in switzerland for a bit also so that was french uh, italy was 23 years of summer so that was uh, italian so I'm sure when people meet you and they listen to you and trying to figure out your accent or if you even have an accent, it's hard for them to pinpoint exactly the origination, right? Uh, it should be. Uh, growing up, uh, if you're changing schools that often and changing countries and languages that often, uh, as a kid, you tend to have a rubber accent, which <laughs> adapts very quickly to the environment that you're in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know that uh, your work... Um, uh, you know, in electrical engineering, led to PhD, you've done postdoc research, uh, you taught at Stanford as well as Harvard. Um, can you tell us how your research eventually evolved into one of your earlier companies, Numeric Technologies? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I was actually at Stanford when that work started. And my background uh, was really in control systems, signal processing, wireless communications. Everything but semiconductors, which is the topic of uh, and the event and was the focus of my first company. And at that point in time, there was uh, a lot of concern that the semiconductor industry would not be able to continue down this path of, of smaller, faster, cheaper. And the reason for that was that we had uh, technologies that were used to manufacture these chips, which uh, involved a photolithographic process where images are projected onto a photosensitive material. And the wavelength of light that was being used was getting to be uh, much larger than the features you were trying to create. Mm -hmm. uh, the industry had put, at that point in time, about uh, a 20 or $30 billion effort behind x-rays just simply to lower the wavelength. And uh, we were working on a project funded by DARPA that said, hey, can, is, is there a way to apply some of these more mathematically oriented techniques to tr tr try to address some of these problems? And we found a very clever way of continuing to manufacture chips at very small feature sizes uh, without changing the wavelength. Hmm. And that was a technology called phase shifting, and that was the origin of my first company. So it, it truly came out of the research at Stanford and uh, later uh, research that was continued while I was at Harvard. Uh, but ultimately, that ended up being the technology which is used to manufacture every chip in the world, even today. And x-rays are certainly out of the picture. Well, it's an incredible footprint that you've left and a, a legacy uh, truly in the history books. That's uh, terrific. And actually, it, it actually represents or illustrates a very important business model, which is that we sometimes we try to change or for, forcibly change a certain process when, in fact, uh, we need to stay within a certain cost structure, actually, or lower the cost structure while still trying to work with existing standards and protocols. Absolutely. And Tell us about your uh, work with InfoWorks. Uh, how, how did you make that eventual transition? What exactly is it? And what are you looking to accomplish? Let me give you a little, a little background there. It, it was an unusual transition into InfoWorks. So I've also been in, uh, sort of involved in on the venture investing side. Uh, started a fund called Nexus Venture Partners, which today is one of the largest uh, India-facing early-stage funds. Uh, and uh, the second one, where I'm currently still a partner, is Centerview Capital, uh, which is a later-stage uh, enterprise technology-focused fund. Now, uh, 
with Infoworks, I met the founder through uh, in, uh, through Nexus actually, and the founder uh, Amar Arsikeri had been at Google a number of years uh, prior to that, and he was actually the the it led the efforts to build out the first big data systems at Google, which, as you might imagine, is a large scaled up. Uh, activity that needs a lot of automation and a lot of uh, other cleverness. He went on to build a similar system at Singa as general manager of their gaming platform. And when I met him, he had a very simple statement. He said that, look, uh, Google may have been the only customer for this type of a product a number of years ago, but his belief was that going forward, everyone would need the same level of agility with their data and analytics that companies like Google and other digital natives have naturally built. And first of all, he was absolutely right. So we funded it through Nexus, I joined the board. And when it came to the uh, second round of funding, uh, my uh, fund that I'm currently part of, Centerview Capital, looked at it. And while it was early for us, we realized the potential of the company and invested and led that round. And about a year and a half ago, uh, I changed uh, my view once again uh, in that it became very clear that the opportunity for this company was very large, and therefore uh, I joined as CEO. Uh, my partner, Dave Dorman, who uh, was the former CEO of at and he joined as chairman. And my second partner, our third partner, uh, Ned Hooper, who was the former chief strategy officer of Cisco, joined as president and chief operating officer. It's about as all in as a fund can get. Uh, in uh, a portfolio company, uh, and we're excited to be part of building and running this. So, second part of your question, what do we do? Uh, if you look around at any enter enterprise, you will find that every single one of them is trying to leverage the data assets that they have in a far more efficient and meaningful way to either enhance their customer experience or, or streamline their business operations. And in that setting, it's quite a challenge because these traditional enterprises have silos of data everywhere and they have not really put down the sort of foundational platform that you might find in a digital native uh, to manage that data and make it available for analytics or other applications uh, to meet their end goals. So what InfoWorks has done is we've taken an approach of automating that entire process of discovering data within the enterprise bringing it into a big data system, could be on-premise or in the cloud, organizing that data with things like catalogs and metadata and lineage and audit and history trails, and then once again, automating the process of preparing that data and operationalizing it so it can be consumed by the applications. It could be simple business reporting, or it could be more sophisticated AI and ML uh, type of applications. But that entire process of data operations and orchestration, which we call EDO2, Enterprise Data Operations and Orchestration, is what we manage on a single platform, single system, uh, that is a large scaled up enterprise system and product. Yeah, so the, the, the genesis of how you guys got involved with InfoWorks is really intriguing because, well, first of all, most VCs, of course, generally are not operational. They've gone through the usual track record of, you know, the the Harvard, the Bain, and then several years at a VC firm. Here, um, you guys were operational to begin with, uh, prior to that, to a great extent. Yes. Uh, but I'm, I wonder what gave, what was that kind of pivotal uh, tipping point that gave you the confidence that this was a truly large market? What was that signal? I, I wouldn't say there was any one signal, uh, but Clearly, over the past, call it eight to 10 years, we have been hearing about big data. I'm not a fan of the term big data because it doesn't matter how big it is. It matters that you have the ability to leverage it. Uh, and it, clearly, this, this, this has all kinds of implications and is, a, by, in and of itself, is a large market. What gave us the conviction to move forward in, into operating roles in this company was really seeing how different the solution is that Amr had put together and watching the market turn towards that solution. So let me, just to give you a little context on that, when these, these terms such as big data and so on so started flying around, initially people took the same approach that they had for legacy systems to 
of preparing their data involving lots of coding, lots of manual intervention, lots of time and money spent just to prepare data and make it available for a single analytical use case. And they went down that path for some period of time. And what we saw over the past two years, which is, if you wish, a trigger for uh, why we jumped in, is the entire market shifted away from that sort of point tool, manually intensive, uh, skill intensive uh, activity and realized they needed a more holistic approach to this or a platform with a great deal of automation and integration that simplified this activity. And we realized that InfoWorks uh, had that platform. In fact, it's not hard to imagine why, because this is, if Google had to do all their stuff manually, they would have a hard time. Uh, and uh, that was it, was, it was those two triggers, realizing that we had the right platform. We clearly understood it was a big market. It's always has been a big market. Um, but uh, understanding that the mar entire market was shifting towards the type of solution that Amar had built and the company had built uh, was really the motivator. Yeah, you make a really interesting point, which is that, um, you know, <coughs> prior to such a solution, really it's professional services driven. It's the, the dreams for the likes of Deloitte, Accenture, and, and, and others that are in this business where it's service oriented. Um, now you're providing something that's automated, code-free, configurable, easy to set up. Uh, now, since then, of course, your market, the EDO space, has become fairly crowded to an extent. Tell us about how that market has evolved and how you guys are positioned. Well, we're delighted that it's become crowded, but um, it, it, it validates what you're doing, in, in, in a sense. We were the only ones out there with this a few years ago. Uh, however, what we're what we're seeing is that it is crowded with uh, more marketing efforts than real product efforts, and that's natural. Right? Why? Because we are not the only ones listening to these customers and understanding what they're what they need. And I think there's been a, a sort of a realization at a large scale that companies need more holistic approaches and more highly automated approaches to managing and leveraging their data. So. What differentiates us is, uh, A, this is the third time that Amr has built it. Uh, he built it at Google, he built it at Senga, and this is the commercial manifestation of it. Uh, the second thing is that we have been at this long enough as a company uh, to truly establish a robust enterprise-grade platform, and it's been architected from day one to be just that. Uh, and I think others are trying to play catch-up, and so our real differentiation lies in the fact that A, we have it, uh, B, it has been uh, battle tested. It, it is deployed in some very large enterprises, some of the largest enterprises in, in this country. And the last piece that I will add to this is, uh, and this was, this was a uh, clever architectural introduction by Amr. Uh, one of the key struggles that companies have had with big data efforts is the complexity of the underlying system. So if you think about Hadoop, if you think about uh, the, the cloud uh, infrastructure and so on, it's really quite complex. And one of the things that we've done is we've abstracted away from that complexity. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about this as a three layer cake where you have a compute infrastructure underneath, you build an operating system on top of that. And you can think of the cloud vendors and cloud infrastructure, even on-prem, as being the compute layer. The operating system layer should be things like, or are things like Hadoop and Spark, et cetera, that lay on top of that. And to date, everyone has been writing to that operating system directly. What we do is we abstract away, and this is how we create a code free environment, and we deal with optimization for the infrastructure and operating system under the hood. And this is a dramatic simplification of uh, the skill level that's needed. It's what we see in any setting where compute has taken off and software development has taken off. You have to abstract away from that underlying system. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really great point because otherwise, prior to that abstraction layer, uh, companies would have to have very specialized skill sets that can actually be able to develop directly and interface with the Hadoop, Sparks, and other large right. NoSQL databases and, and, and data sets. So the fact that they're agnostic to that and just simply do what they need to do without actually getting down to that level is very interesting. And as well as uh, not being tied to any one particular standard that could be uh, you know, 
overridden by something else. Um, as you look at your product roadmap moving forward, what are kind of the big market challenges or changes and how are you guys tuning or reflecting that into the roadmap? Well, I think one of the things that has really accelerated is the adoption of the cloud. Okay. And when you look at the adoption of the cloud, uh, for large enterprises, it does not mean abandonment of their on-premises systems. It simply means an extension into the cloud. In fact, I think Gartner published a number that 80% of all enterprises are running in multi-cloud environments. We're uniquely so suited to that. Again, the abstraction plays, plays a role. Uh, but I think that is front and center in our thinking about roadmap, uh, continuing to enhance and grow the support for these complex hybrid and multi-cloud environments, uh, which are becoming the norm uh, as, you, as you look forward. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great because uh, I'm sure some of the, your competitors are only just focusing on one single section, whether it's just pure cloud, as an example, and that is limiting some of the other more complexities and use cases. Can you walk us through maybe a sample case study and just kind of give us a little bit more of a kind of a meet around how a particular customer have used your system? Absolutely. So uh, actually, let me take let me take the example of Macy's. So Macy's is a customer. And as any retailer, uh, they are anxious to figure out how they compete uh, against all of the digital disruption that's going on in their industry. So they came to us uh, after starting to build a system themselves. Uh, they spent about two years on that. Uh, and they realized that the complexity of what they wanted to do was something that, that if there was a commercial solution, this would be a better option for them. And they were focused on creating a customer 360. Okay, why? As a retailer, you are forced into not only a brick and mortar presence, but also a, an online presence. Now, unification of that experience for you as a customer. So Scott, if you were to walk up and buy something online and then you walk into a store, you should expect some knowledge of what you've done online. Uh, whether re you buy something online, return it in the store, exchange it in another store, all of this needs a great deal of unification of the core data around the touch points that a customer has or a consumer has with their business. So that was the, that was the starting point of the journey. And uh, they've since expanded it. That they, they, they look at their supply chain, the fulfillment, uh, other operational uh, pieces. And within 12 months, we took them from a point where they were running zero jobs to where they're now running 165,000 jobs a month. And they are, this is a scale that you could never achieve without automation. They have launched 431 use cases on this and built out hundreds of pipelines and loaded up hundreds of data sources. So for something to operate at that scale, right, which is where everyone needs to go, uh, you have data all over the place. You need to bring it together and you need to be very, very agile in how you launch and, and develop analytics use cases because that becomes central to your competitive uh, positioning in the market. Uh, to do that without the level of automation that we bring to the table would have been impossible. You just couldn't do it. Uh, so those are the types of things that we are seeing and we're seeing this with other large companies as well. We have some very, very large companies as customers. Uh, but all of them are very focused on a organized gathering, consolidating, and organizing their data, and then using that to business advantage, whether it's uh, customer experience or operational efficiencies. Uh, they're aimed at both. Now, uh, one other thing I would uh, I would say about that is that you know there's there's a lot of talk about AI and ML, which I, I believe are very powerful techniques. In fact. Uh, part of what I did when, while I was still in academics was geared around AI and ML. Uh, I think those are very, very powerful techniques, but, but the key to success in AI and ML is the ability to, to rapidly iterate on ideas. No one knows what the answer is. They don't know the, what the best way to use AI or ML will be for their business. And in order to rapidly iterate on ideas, you need to be able to rapidly access and use the data because this is data dependent. And without the agility and sort of flexibility that you, you derive from things like automation, uh, that becomes next to impossible. If you can only try one experiment every six months, you won't get very far. 
if you can try six experiments a day, that's a different story. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that I, I that unless you're in the industry that people may not necessarily appreciate is that oftentimes uh, large companies uh, will sell a full stack uh, with the with the ambition of being able to do incredible amount of versatile data analytics, when in fact the actual implementation is a hodgepodge combination of professional services, customization, and components that they built or will build together. I hear what you're talking about is a core function that is becoming an absolute necessity for any organization because we are being becoming so data driven and analytics driven in terms of decision making and business support that is it has to be at that scale it has to be at that agility it has to be at that speed um, so my last question for you that we ask everyone is share with us perhaps maybe a product failure and the lessons learned that you can share with others well i don't have a good example of a product failure but um, here's something that's relevant to the times that we're in uh, i used to run a video services company which was a fairly capital intensive company uh, and just around October of 2008, uh, the markets changed. Right? And so capital intensity was not a good attribute to have. Uh, the, that experience was interesting. Now, ultimately, we had to pivot that company into more of a technology platform play uh, and eventually sold the company. But uh, I, if I look around myself right now uh, and what's happening out there in the world with the markets, with uh, uh, you know, other sort of global issues. Uh, I think we're, there's some likelihood uh, that we, we may have to buckle up our seatbelts and ride through. And so the lesson learned from the last one, 08, uh, forces me to think a little bit harder about how we navigate through here. Yeah, great advice. Uh, and again, at the time of this recording, this is in March. Um, we're not sure exactly when the episode will come out, but certainly, we are very much at a very interesting tipping point in global economics. So with that, I've been joined by Dr. Bruno Patti, who is the chairman and CEO of InfoWorks. Thanks for joining today. Thank you very much, Scott. Really enjoyed it.